few minutes for everyone to arrive and then we'll start our presentation. So I think we'll get started for the people that are here. Uh, welcome everyone to Indigenous Micronesia versus Global Climate Change. My name is Andrew Stone. I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow. We are here tonight online and live also from the Rotary Peace Center at Chula Longkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand. And just to notice this event is being recorded, so you can take whatever steps with your camera that you wish, your personal camera. I'd like to start with a thank you to Rotary and the Rotary Peace Fellow Program for bringing us all together. Uh, Rotary Peace Fellows, myself and Spencer, um, to study peace building. As a result of these Rotary Peace Fellowship programs, we have over a thousand fellows globally and our alumni association involved in on the ground projects as well as education and cultural exchange events like we have here tonight. This event was organized by a subgroup of the Rotary Peace Fellow Alumni Association Asia Oceania Working Group and Spencer Lung. He's managing our platform tonight. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, this is the second in a series of films that are, we plan to happen on the last Saturday of the month every month. Uh, last month, Spencer organized an event with some Lao filmmakers releasing short films about the construction of a railway between Southern China through Northern Lao to the Lao capital of Vientiane. And this is a theme in our series. They are, our films each month tend to focus on some aspect of environment and people's lives and livelihoods related to the environment around them and the mixed impacts of development um, on their lives. Tonight, our film follows Larry and his crew of young canoe builders from the Pacific Island state of Yap and the Federated States of Micronesia as they learn traditional navigation skills and race to build an ocean going canoe to sail to Guam in time for the Festival of Pacific Arts and Culture to deliver a message of warning and hope about the dangers of climate change, uh, impacts of climate change on island culture. After the film tonight, we will have a live panel discussion moderated by Dr. Vitun Viryasakultorn, Deputy Director of the Rotary Peace Center at Chula Longkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand, with the film's producer and director, Douglas Varshall. We also have with us tonight, Sandra Okada, who's the president of a traditional seafaring organization, TASA, and master seafarer, Larry Ragatal, also Larry Shaumai and Melissa Titano, who were involved in the voyage that we're about to see. So thank you for coming again, everyone. The film is about 70 minutes long, after which we will rejoin for the discussion with the producer director and the people involved in the voyage. If you just joined, we're coming together live and online from the Rotary Peace Center at Chula Longkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand. If there aren't any other staff announcements, we'll ask Spencer to start the film, Wage, Mysteries of the Wayfinding Voyage. Uh, technology, it can get so very exciting, but I think we always revert back to the roots of things, yeah? Uh, you know, here we are trying to get this film on and we're all excited, but anyways. Um, the film, as you will see, hopefully we'll get over the technical glitch there. But uh, uh, hello to everyone, by the way, my friends from Guam who are on. It's so good to see people that you recognize. <clears throat> the film um, speaks to, uh, um, and as you probably read it on, on the email that went out and the flyers, uh, Douglas Fargel worked with me to, uh, to get a few of our Wage boys. Wage is uh, an organization that I help co-founded and in fact as I'm speaking I'm out here in South Carolina trying to work with blacksmiths to forge a new ads blade uh, blades so that we can continue carving canoes but the project was done to work with uh, this youth in terms of carving out a canoe and rig it and and sail up to Guam for for the 2016 fest pack and as you will see from the film uh, we did make it up to Fesbach, and we're grateful to the TASA folks and to uh, 
uh, everyone who were wonderful hosts in Guam for the uh, Festback event. And, uh, but not the canoe itself. The canoe just completed after that due to all kinds of uh, difficulties and challenges we faced. But bigger of it was to get uh, a, sort, a short message out to the community with respect to uh, climate change. And so uh, a sail was woven by bandanas uh, materials and that sail, uh, my hope at that time was to have that sail travel the world uh, on its own. It's gone to places from Guam to, it was displayed at the University of Guam, then it went out to Hawaii. And then it went up to New York for the first ocean summit uh, by the United Nation. And that sail was, a display, was on display there. It went to Hamburg, Germany for the, for the G6 uh, summit there. And then eventually to Australia where so the sail is still making its uh, circumferential voyage, but hopefully one day it'll get back. I'm not sure if we've gotten over the technical issue, uh, Andrew. The will be moderated by uh, Dr. Batoon, the program's deputy director at the Rotary Peace Center. You are welcome to put some questions or comments into the chat box, and I believe he has some questions prepared as well. So again, we're going to be meeting now with uh, Master Seafarer Larry Regatal, who you saw in the film, Sandra Okada, who is president of TASA, the uh, Seafaring Association. We have Larry Shamai and uh, Melissa Taetano, I believe, yes. And the director and producer of the film, Douglas Varshall, is also with us today. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Ajahn Bertun. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you very much. I hope you all enjoy the film. Um, I think you will, you will agree with me that it's a beautiful documentary film. It was really well shot, well documented. And I think you will also agree with me that climate change is real. It's happening everywhere. It's not just in Micronesia. Um, well, one thing that I just want to add here before I continue with asking question is the Rotary International recently just added one more area of interest, which is environment. Now we're talking about here peace and development and also environment. So you can see from this film that it is serious and, and we are dealing with all these things now. Um, I think uh, I'll just, because we only have, have half an hour, uh, for the discussion, I just want to go maybe to Larry because he was in the film from the beginning to the end. And I really like the beginning of the film when he was in the classroom with his students and talking about the changing environment and that impacting culture and things like that. And culture is also changing. And at the end, he also mentioned, mentioned about, again, you know, climate change and something that is beyond our control. I just want to go to uh, the first question that, how do you see the impact now within the communities in that area? Actually, the film mentioned a lot about that already, but perhaps you can give a few more comments on that, that after, I think the film was documented in 2018, that was correct? two years ago 16 17 2016 now 2020 so now after four years are things getting worse is anything that you are trying to solve the problem there so larry you have any question you have any comment on on that and sandra can also uh, comment on that please uh, yes so thank you dr vitun and uh, i welcome once again everybody that is on the show or on the screening. Uh, and as far as the question of climate change and how it's impacting uh, small islands like Lamatrek that is nothing more than six feet above sea level, uh, it's real, it's happening. Um, this film was uh, shot out in 2016. So here we are 2020 and I'm pretty sure that a lot more has uh, 
happen in as far as all the physical impact of climate change from from salt water intrusion into our meager resources, taro patches to uh, coral leaf bleaching, name it, etc. Uh, it's happening. I think for for us as a small community, our our issue now, uh, very compelling issue, is for us to start to look at how we can how we can survive beyond. Um, the island might be underwater uh, some years uh, down the road, but I think even before it goes underwater, it's probably going to be rendered uh, useless for inhabitants if if the small water lens, fresh water lens is, is no longer uh, there and, and uh, killing all the crops that we depend on. So um, I know that uh, we've been, uh, there is a steady trend of people, not just from Lama Trek, but uh, also small islands that are part of the outer island groups in the FSM or Federated States of Micronesia and maybe perhaps like elsewhere a trend of people migrating to the centers. And for us in Yap, the, I recall not too long ago when my first time I visited the Yap Center, our, our community of outer island people that would go there only were confined to, or at least limited to uh, medical referrals. That has changed over time. Used to be around nothing more than uh, 200 people the most hoovering you know, around that number in the main island of Yap. Those mm -hmm. who work for the government and those who uh, are going there for medical reasons. Today, however, um, is surely over a thousand of us from all the outer islands in, in Yap moving to the center. Of course, we're moving there by choice, uh, but uh, I know that it won't be too long before we are forced to move there. So maybe addressing the issue uh, for us might be, uh, you know, how we relocate eventually, which then brings a lot more into question of how do we maintain our culture and, and therefore our identity in that regard. So uh, really the, the backbone, if you like, to, to WAGE, which is also titled the film, and that's the organization that we started, is to try and see if we can replicate some of this in the in the new settlement that we have of Main Island Yap now, and ensuring that the future generation can at least learn uh, as best as they can, or as we can by pairing elders with the young people to to continue this uh, uh, traditional knowledge uh, of seafaring. Again, I like to just point out that seafaring, that's one component of it that you might have seen, which is the canoe and the actual navigation by stars and getting from one point to another. But the bigger picture is more than that. You know, it's, it's all about greater values that lies behind seafaring that allows apprentices and those that are learning to learn more than just that. You know, it entails a whole series of indigenous knowledge that has their own values that means more than just getting from place to place but climate change is real it's happening and uh, unfortunately we're probably the least contributor to it in terms of the impact but we are at the forefront that's for sure and i think uh, you know i'll leave it there and see if sandra and and uh, uh, others larry is in the background if you want to say something i can easily translate and add, you know, and Melissa Douglas as the producer of the film. So thank you. Thank you, Larry. Sandra, you have anything to add on, please? You're muted. Okay, I, I think I'm unmuted okay. now. Um, Thank you for the question. I, I believe we're, we're looking at, you know, what has changed in, in the four years since this voyage that was documented actually took place to 2020. Um, I believe it's just clearer that the reality of climate change is, is definitely here. And, and 
um, Guam is fortunate to be a, a high island in um, some respects compared to Lama Trek where Tyler Larry's from and Let Larry here. Um, these, most of Micronesia is, of course, tiny islands. Most of it are low-lying atolls. And um, the reality of becoming, you know, uh, climate change refugees is, is just becoming uh, more apparent. Um, the entire Republic of Kiribati is considering moving the entire population off of, um, so, I mean, that's mind-boggling that an entire country um, may be displaced and may become uh, climate change refugees. And when you think of uh, traditions and culture and how deeply rooted it is in our identity, how do you relocate an entire country and take that, those uh, traditional knowledge and skills and culture and identity in, in the wake of uh, an event that we contribute very um, little to, but are incredibly impacted by as, as Pacific people and islanders. So that's just my, my thoughts on this, this whole concept of climate change and impacts to us in Micronesia. Thank you, Sandra. Any other person in the panel? Is that young man sitting behind you want to say something? <laughs> okay. Um, well, actually, you know, that, that I mean, your response uh, actually led to the second question that I have is that how do you foresee conflicts, any conflicts that might occur in your community caused by climate change? I'm talking about degraded environment, sea level rise, loss of land and culture, more competition for resources. We talk about water, you know, scarcity, you know, I mean, all those things. Uh, now that's happening, um, not just in, in your island, but also in, in other islands. So do you foresee any conflicts that might occur in the near future? Well, uh, yeah, I think that uh, the mere fact that um, climate change is happening uh, and all that uh, it brings along to our shores, uh, conflict is already happening. You know, conflict is happening with us and small islands like our mine, and even from uh, having to move from one place to another. And I think for the, the most part, for us, it's, it's uh, the unknown, you know, what will happen to our children, what will happen to the culture that is in a way. So um, I think to that regard, the conflict continues and will continue to, to happen. Uh, as we go down the road and, and uh, it's a matter of us making sure that uh, we can survive as a group of people mm -hmm. and that's sort of like the reason why we we uh, want to get the message out get our pandanus sail to go display at places around the world and uh, and spread the message that the climate change is, is in fact uh, real uh, and uh, hello okay um, well, thank you, Larry and Sandra. You have any any thought on this, on the conflict? Um, that... um, no, I, I agree with everything uh, how Larry had uh, brought up, and I just uh, um, yield to 
his his thoughts on on this uh, concept of uh, conflict. Okay. Um, yeah. we'll June, if I if I can uh, just add, and this is kind of bridging both the the, the questions that were uh, the question that was previously uh, previously asked and uh, this current one is um, one um, the idea of uh, you know how is climate change how is climate change affected uh, island culture um, I think that it's important to to come from a, a point of you know that kind of question is formulated really from an anthropocentric worldview. Um, climate change changes everything in the Pacific, ideas of culture, ideas of identity, um, because we come from a biocentric worldview, meaning that, you know, we're part of nature. Uh, we're not there to conquer it. We don't own it. We can't possess it. We can't dominate it. We can't draw and carve up the Pacific into specific areas. We can't own uh, 200 miles of, you know, economic zones. Um, it's a it's a whole different uh, approach, um, and so so in terms of conflict, one uh, you know we have to we have to deal within we can't separate climate change without really speaking about um, uh, colonialism, right? Which is uh, close to about five hundred years, um, and then climate change really kind of it, it it tells us that you know a kind of Western approach industrialization. Um, accumulation of material goods that that while we have to live and I'm from Guam and I was right you know I was born and trained in the American system that um, in order to survive we have to pick up skills of uh, uh, you know from the more modern world yet at the same time um, we come from a cult we come from different respect in you know, our respective cultures island cultures uh, where uh, we still in, in order to survive uh, within our own cultural environments we have different realities and different values. So there's mm -hmm. always been conflict, you know? Um, and so when it comes to climate change on one hand, you know, basic things like, and Larry mentioned some of the main ones, uh, you know, the ocean is hotter. We see the beautiful corals that we used to swim in uh, are now dead, right? Uh, we, you know, go out and fish and the fish that are along the reef, their bellies are filled with coral because they're starving and they're trying to exist, um, you know, amidst all the demands that, you know, the kind of uh, the Western society has, uh, has, uh, has really, uh, you know, uh, asked of, of nature, right? So, um, so I think that really what we've tried to do is try to, and I think that, you know, one of the things that's in, that I've come to learn is that with climate change, there's also been a catalyst to return back to those things that we know are tried, you know, have been tried and they're true. Things that have lasted longer than 500 years. We're talking about seafaring. We're talking about oral tradition. We're talking about stories that we've been told since we were younger that have been relegated to realms of uh, legend and, uh, you know, things that are missing. Um, so, you know, climate change is not simply an assault on our way of living. It's an assault uh, on our homes, on our land, on our heavens, on our spirits, you know, it's a, a, of a people. Now, Micronesia is really fascinating because we were the first settled in the Pacific. So we can see why, you know, it was wonderful that the Hawaiian uh, Renaissance was really prompted by and really, you know, assisted uh, by, by efforts of um, Nainoa Thompson, but also, you know, our esteemed, you know, Grandmaster Traditional Navigator Mount Pialu from Satchwal. So an assault on these islands, these smaller low-lying islands is an assault on all of the Pacific. Let's be clear about that. You know, it's not just, okay, climate change happens. Let's see, okay, we'll lose some of this. No, an assault on the small islands is an assault on the entire Pacific. So, I, so the conflict is multifaceted and multi-layered. Thank you so much. I think that's what I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, this kind of thinking, I, I think it's kind of disappearing um, that, you know, I mean, in, in many parts of the world that we're dealing with capitalism, you know, and materials and all technologies. And often we forgot about our roots, our tradition, about our culture. And I think this is very, very important. 
and 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 that lead to my next question about i mean we actually we try to have one more young person we have a young generation to be on the panel uh, unfortunately he could not make it um because here we're talking about preserving our culture and trying to go back to what we did in the past you have any um thought or any ideas or you heard about this from the young generation whether they want to go back or they want to just move ahead with new technology you know modernized society you know is there anything like that that actually we have a serious problem now in thailand a generation gap <laughs> i wonder what you have that kind of issues <laughs> anyone can share larry or melissa or sandra <laughs> uh maybe i'll i'll uh... I'll jump in here and the others can uh, also add in. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if it's, uh, the issue should be, do we want to go back? I think we're, we're far down the road now. And as far as modern, the world influence is, uh, at least from my part, as I teach and I work with young people from the island, uh, I've had, uh, you know, times when I question myself, what's the idea here to, do we need to uh, uh, educate these people and have to turn uh, the young people to to uh, not be exposed to to what's happening outside? And and I've always concluded, and I think maybe most would, um, the wind has uh, blown too strong in the sail right now. But I think that uh, our ancestors also found the the tech came up with the technology, as you saw in the film, for us to reef that sail um, and to reef it so to allow a smaller target uh, from the wind so that we can sail smoothly. To me, that's that's sort of like the mission that I see is to is to work with the young people, like my nephew there, uh, the other Larry sitting behind, you know, give them the exposure necessary, but even more importantly, ensure that they know uh, their roots, you know, one of the very basic, one of the very basic fundamental technique of traditional navigation, when you start to learn, your masters always, when you're sailing off on the horizon, the masters will always make sure that you know where the island at your stern disappeared before mm -hmm. you can uh, know where the island of destination is, because you got to take into factor the drift, all the, the current, everything else, even though the stars in the sail charts is, you know, this is your start uh, to take your course to, you've got to make adjustment. And to do, to be able to make adjustment, you must know that island of origin in order for you to know the island of destination. And in some ways that to me, that's a metaphor thing that I try to teach <coughs> the young apprentices that are working with me. You know, you're going to go out into this world. It's going to happen. Globalization is real. Um, but please get your both your feet solidly planted on Lama Trek. Know that island. Know your roots. Know your culture. If anything, just have some pride in it uh, and learn those values. Because to me, across the board, all, all, all over this world, I think every culture and every group has certain values that we can all learn from. And on the island of Lama Trek, I've learned that a lot of those values are similarly shared across the board. They may have been skewered by, you know, uh, self uh, need and desire, but uh, at least for the young people that I work with, I try to say, uh, pass on to them that, you know, while you may see that in the Western world, it's all about self first, Please don't forget that on Lama Trek, it's all about community. You're actually at the very bottom of that totem, if you like, and that you have to look up. And, and so you have to understand that your actions impact the next person to you and the person next to them. And eventually it impacts the world and it impacts the, the very living resource that our, our life heavily depends on, the resources. So it's, maybe it's not so much about going back. It's about how do we carry these values forward and ensure that our group survive 
and maybe to some extent that some other bigger industrialized countries can realize that yeah the long before we start to think about uh, oil and about all of these things there were technologies that allow sustainability of of life and all of those techniques and knowledge all evolves around the idea that we don't and as melissa pointed out rightly we don't own this planet we are just a part of it and our our us being realizing that that's important is is uh, is what i want to convey to the students that have been working with me cult in my culture there are two events in life that 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 um you know i as an individual and others who come after me are celebrated you know one is when i'm born um, and the whole island community comes around to celebrate that event and two is when i'm dead and they also celebrate that unfortunately i don't get to be part of those two important events uh, but that's not the point it's what happens in between the life and birth that matters and so we've always been taught that yeah you will be celebrated the whole island community is going to fish and harvest and bring and celebrate unfortunately you're too young and then we're going to celebrate again when you're in that casket but guess what in between is the more important thing for me and for anyone of that island to contribute to the society and ensure that we can live thank you so much I really, really like you respond on this. This is very, very touch, very interesting to me. Um, I'm just, as a moderator, I'm just looking at the time. Um, how much time do we have? Five more minutes for the panel, and then we can open for a few questions. Yeah, no? Okay. Let, let, let's spend another five minutes for the panel. If uh, Sandra or, or Melissa, you know, have something to... To add on, let's do that now, please. May I have a question with Sandra and, and, the, and the panel? Okay, yeah. yeah. Hello, uh, this is uh, Mike Gull and, uh, from Guam. And uh, uh, Sandra referred to the movement off of Kiribati uh, as the sea levels rise and, and living there gets really difficult. Well, um, I, years ago, I, I worked in, in Kiribati and, and some of the other islands in the South Pacific. And some of you may know, um, under the old British colonial times, like before uh, World War II, the British moved a lot of people from low-lying Kiribati islands, or from one particular ocean island, to Fiji. And that was another, they were all British colonies, so the colonial government could do things like that. And they moved the whole population, basically, of uh, ocean island to an island in Fiji called Rambe. And uh, there have been like three generations of the Rambe, of uh, the people from Ocean Island living there with their uh, Kiribati language and customs that they've maintained. And uh, on another uh, low-lying island uh, in Kiribati, uh, the British government moved uh, many of the population to uh, Solomon Islands, which was another British colony in those days, so they could do that. Uh, and again, the customs have uh, been retained uh, but uh, people have been away from their ancestors' homes for several generations. I don't know uh, how well this uh, type of evolution would, would work nowadays with people moving out of the islands, but there's certainly a, a threats uh, of our low-lying islands in, in Micronesia and, and elsewhere uh, for people not to be able to uh, maintain their uh, way of living there. And so, uh, as I, oh, and uh, a man I worked with in Kiribati uh, was, uh, Anote Tong, um, when he was president of Kiribati, he actually bought, had the government buy more land in Fiji. Uh, this was maybe five years ago or a little more, uh, with the intention, uh, as Sandra indicated, of perhaps moving populations there. Um, These are some of the things happening. I thought I'd just uh, relate some of the history. Thank you. Okay, um, Sandra, you have any response to this? Um, I, I just want to touch briefly on even what Larry had mentioned about working with you. Um, we've been spending a lot of time working with youth groups on Guam and especially um, high risk youth that uh, are challenged with being a 
living on a colonized island and was being raised in a, a Western um, society and this whole concept of uh, Western education. And they have uh, little opportunities uh, to learn cultural traditions other than within the home. I mean, these ancient traditions. As an example, like voyaging, um, growing up on Guam, being you know colonized by the Spain and then occupied by Japanese and then colonized again about uh, with, by America. I think it left a, a lot of us on Guam growing up feeling very inferior uh, to the outside world and to a, a Western culture. And that was my mindset growing up and I, I still see it. And now you're exposing, you know, technology to these kids. So now they're seeing, you know, the rest of the world, uh, they're seeing global, um, they're having an impact uh, through technology of what's going on. But the youth that we've worked with and some of these high risk uh, youth especially, um, after spending some time with us, you know, it really instills a, a strong sense of identity and pride in being descendants of uh, seafaring people for them to understand they, they come from a culture where, you know, uh, canoes were hand carved out of trees and our ancestors made this thousand of miles of um, voyaging and, you know, against the wind and into the sun thousands of years ago. So these Voyaging traditions, um, you know, they, they have a lot of history and they were superior and brave um, people that settled our islands and I speak a lot for, for Guam in particular. And today we're, we're sharing that with, with these kids and we're seeing um, an impact and we're seeing a thirst by the youth today. And I, I think that kind of um, drives us and our efforts with Larry and Wage and especially, you know, Casa, that we understand the faster we move forward and the faster we have to face um, issues of globalization and climate change, the, the harder we have to look back to, to traditional knowledge and ancient and cultural practices of living with in your environment and sustaining um, your life and not being so dependent on mm -hmm. what, you know, the ships bring in. I mean, going back to traditional farming because voyaging, as Larry's mentioned, is a set of systems. It's not just about carving a canoe and knowing how to navigate by the stars. You know, it includes identifying, in, in, you know, your indigenous wood that's strong enough for the canoes. It's about planting the food and traditional farming to prepare for the voyage, like we saw in the film, you know, taro, breadfruit, bananas. It's, it's about recognizing um, um, sea markers and the types of fish you're able to spot and migration pa patterns of pilot wells. All this knowledge and medicine, massage, you know, traditional medicine. Um, these are things we've taken for granted. We've kind of put it behind us. But again, this is what we're trying to um, instill in our youth today. Look back, know where you come from. Be proud of um, your voyaging um, descendants because these skills that our ancestors have practiced for thousands of years really is what's going to help us survive the next 4,000 years into the future. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can also, uh, hi, if I can also add to that. Do we have time, Dr. Vitin? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> so, um, so just a little bit of uh, background. I'm, I'm a proud member of the, um, of the House of Fatima, the Canoe House in Guam. And I, uh, I'm, I'm actually a carver, but I carve storyboards and I, I carve kana boards. I just started becoming very interested in carving canoes um, because um, because I realized that traditional seafaring, traditional navigation uh, was not only uh, you know about being able to travel uh, from one island to another island, um, but it's also a, a vessel, a spiritual vessel, you know, that allows island people to transcend um, metaphorically. 
you know, I, as strange as that may sound to, to some people out there, it's a, it's a way of survival of people. We've had, we, we inherited that particular legacy, right, um, from, um, from our Austronesian seafarers. But the connectedness to land, the calling, you know, I think climate change in a very strange and unique way is, has presented some challenges, um, but also some very unique opportunities. Um, so I, you know, was just kind of called to carve. I was called to go to the canoe house and say, you know, as a female, and I'm not a young student, <laughs> clearly I'm not a young student, but as a female, I kind of walked in there and, you know, uh, surrounded by men who are all carving, I thought, well, well, you know, what am I doing? But it, 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 it was just a calling, just as I have a son who, you know, for the longest time, you know, he, all he wanted to do was play internet games and was not even interested. But in the period of COVID, it's kind of, it, it's all of a sudden he's spearfishing every day. You know, we used to spearfish when he was younger and all he wants to do is, is go to the ocean. So I think there's a particular calling that when Mother Earth starts to hurt, that the indigenous people who know her, who know her ways are also called in. That might sound really strange to people, but, and I understand why, but that's our orientation. That's our reality, you know, and the further away that our children whose blood is connected to our ecological landscape, the further away that we get from there, the, the more lost we are. Um, and somehow, and I can't explain exactly how that, you know, happens, why my son who was never you know, who he's, he's, he's always been a good swimmer, always loved the ocean like many of the children. But, you know, now all he ever wants to do is go into the ocean. Just like I, you know, I wasn't really, I didn't have any orientation about, you know, carving canoes. I was carving other things, but now I'm, I'm called to do that. And I think in many ways, the, the threat to our environment um, has, is a catalyst to indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways that are more sustainable you know, um, um, more sustainable in, in the current world. And I think it's about, it's not about choosing because the reality is, is that we're made of both, right? I, there's nothing that can change the fact that, you know, Guam was colonized and that entire history that I went to an American school and there were really good things. I mean, there's great things about Western culture. There's wonderful things about science. Um, but I think it, it's, uh, it also has made me very well aware as an indigenous person that I can't just kind of try to mimic, you know, Western institution and Western ways. I really have to take a look at uh, what's important and what promotes local culture. So take the best of what Western uh, science and Western knowledge has to offer, but also uh, take what's relevant um, of, of indigenous culture in today's context uh, in order to create a balance right a balance between so that you know i can do things like on one hand um i can carve the kind of boards the spirit boards uh i can carve canoes but i can also pay taxes you know <laughs> i mean as as uh you know uh you know as, as but that's conflict you know and that's something that i don't think it's necessarily something that we you know have to look at and lament i think that was just something that we have to appreciate as a strength uh and and try to convince others that you know, in this age of really not epistemic exploitation, but epistemic modernization, that in, as indigenous people, as island people, we have much to offer, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and, uh, and that whatever, and we don't have to take everything. Uh, we don't have to model ourselves after Americans or after the British or after the French, um, uh, that we're strong and we're stronger, you know, because of it. So, um, I don't think it's a choice. I think it's, I think we can do both. Uh, and one of the, you know, Larry messaged, messaged me because um, I'm working on a model canoe with him. And, um, and because he's away, right, uh, I've been, you know, carving out the pieces and I would send him pictures. So this is an example of kind of adaptation, right? And sending him pictures. And so he's gotten the skill of being able to, on his smartphone, mark up the pictures. And I had my son teach me how to be able to mark pictures so that you know, he can tell me what the next cut's going to be. Um, so uh, there are creative ways, and I think technology is not a, necessarily a bad thing. Technology can be used for good things to promote exact to promote our cultural ways. Uh, we just have to be able to articulate them, and we have to be able to identify them, uh, and decide what's culturally relevant and what's important, right, uh, uh, in today's age. 
Oh, thank you. Exactly. Thank you so much. That was very, very interesting response. Um, in terms of the time that we have, I, I wish we had more time, but I, I think we really have to uh, cut it short now because the, uh, it has been two hours. And I would like to thank all the panelists and again, you know, for uh, being with us uh, today. And uh, before I stop talking, I will just ask Spencer or Andrew, yeah, if you have anything to, to say, you know, your last words for this interesting event. So Andrew. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Ajahn Prasoon. I would just like to thank again, uh, Rotary and the Rotarians in Bangkok for hosting the, sponsoring the in-person portion of the event at the Rotary Peace Center and uh, for sponsoring our fellowships uh, th through which we were all able to come together and engage in projects and create events um, such as these. If you'd like to, I'll put in the chat um, a link to the Facebook page for the Rotary Peace Fellowship Alumni Association. Uh, we'd hope to see you again. Again, this is a monthly uh, film series, the last Saturday of each month. Uh, Spencer, do you have anything you'd like to add before we go? I want to thank our guests again. Uh, really incredible uh, film. Douglas, thank you so much. Uh, Larry, both Larrys, uh, Sandra, and Melissa as well. Uh, thank you so much. I really, I can't even, uh, I don't have words to express how, how excited and how grateful I am to have been a part of this experience with you all. Um, Spencer, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, thank you, Andrew. No. All right then. And so, thank uh, you, everyone. Uh, John Bertun, do you have anything you'd like to say to close us out? Um, not really. I just want to say thank you again for. I mean, we have like almost ten people joining us at the center. We have a few Rotarians and some of the people. So I'm um, I'm I'm thankful for them uh, to be to to be with us tonight, this evening, and. Yes. Thank you, Doug, for the other film. For the film. You want to say something, Douglas? You have been quiet. Just say a few words. You, you did a very good job. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I really don't have anything to say other than because you've listened to me for an hour and what, 15 minutes? <laughs> um, so um, if people want further, uh, want, some, want some dialogue, you can email me. Always happy to chat. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Just, okay. Just also, before Douglas leaves, I want to say thank you, Douglas, for everything. The story is not done. <laughs> Douglas and I are, <laughs> are going to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, part two, if you like. Uh, <laughs> and I know I'll keep Douglas on. on that, right. So, well, uh, just, just look out for it. Gonna, we're going to go out and go filming in the um, summer. And we're going to try to uh, really do some serious wayfinding uh, filming on the new canoe and the canoe you and the boys finished over the past couple of years. And um, the venture, the adventure is only beginning. And, and we'd like to invite anybody to come along, right? You're the, you're the master. You know, when I was, was watching the film, I asked myself, do you don't get seasick at all? You know, <laughs> it was tough, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So I hope to see you again in, I don't know when, uh, we'll have, yeah, another month maybe, if anyone is interested in joining another film screening. And you'll be informed by Spencer. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Please feel welcome to follow us on Facebook and reach out to us uh, through the link in the chat bar. I'll give you a moment to copy that if you need to, and then we'll sign off. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rotary. Thank you, Douglas. <laughs>